Hey there, it's Dr. Sarah here. Today on the She Found Motherhood podcast, I have the pleasure of chatting with Dr. Beth Taylor. Dr. Taylor is an infertility specialist and co-founder of Olive Fertility Center. Her areas of particular interest are in vitro fertilization, egg freezing, and surrogacy. And believe it or not, Dr. Beth and I also know each other personally as she was one of my staff when I was an OBGYN resident in Vancouver. She is a wonderful human, and we had an amazing conversation about the basics of how to get pregnant. Now, chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably trying to get pregnant, or you're thinking about it soon. We've put together a resource for anyone who's preparing for pregnancy. It's easy to read, and it helps you optimize your physical and mental health as you begin your journey through parenthood. If you're interested, head on over to www.shefoundhealth.ca forward slash PFP. That's www. Dot shefoundhealth.ca forward slash PFP. And we'll put the link in the show notes below. We'll get into the podcast with Dr. Taylor right after this quick message. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. We are doctors Sarah and Alicia, maternity physicians and moms who have been through it all. We want to empower you with knowledge so you can have the best pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experience you can. She Found Health and She Found Motherhood is meant for general medical information only. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This information does not apply to every situation. If you have questions or if you've received different advice, please contact your healthcare provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or another qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The views expressed by She Found Health and She Found Motherhood and our guests are not representative of any of the institutions with which we are affiliated. Some of our podcast episodes are sponsored so that we can keep getting great info out there to you, our listeners. We only partner with companies that we truly believe in. Some of our links and suggestions may be affiliates, and we would appreciate you using them to help fund this important work. Now let's get to it. Welcome, Dr. Taylor, to the She Found Motherhood podcast. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited. So we were chatting briefly beforehand. Now we actually know each other from my former life, but uh, we're going to talk about how to get pregnant, the basics of how to get pregnant. And I thought perhaps we could start by just me asking you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the work you do and why you're an expert in this topic. Sure. So I'm Beth Taylor. I did obstetrics and gynecology, and then I did extra training for two years in infertility. So just kind of focusing on how to help people get pregnant using science. And then I, once I finished that training, which is called an REI fellowship. Then I started practicing in Vancouver and I've been doing infertility care in Vancouver since then, which has been about, I guess, nearly 15 years now. And the last several years have been at a fertility clinic called All of Fertility. And uh, I'm quite passionate about this topic. You know, it's so interesting when you say how to get pregnant. It, you know, you might eye roll and pose such a simple question, but truthfully, like, I think we all know fairly well, if you finished high school in, in Canada, you probably know how to not get pregnant. Yes, totally. You know how to, to get pregnant, or you may not know how to get pregnant. So I think this is a really, I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation because hopefully it'll maybe help a couple people. No, it's so funny because I was just thinking that like you spend your whole, I mean, most of us spend many of our reproductive years just trying not to get pregnant. That's right. And then you decide you want to get pregnant, but we don't have any education around that. You know, all right. we know you is don't have a nurse, your high school nurse telling you how not to get pregnant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, your friends are super, you know, you're, you're happy to talk about with your friends because trying not to get pregnant seems kind of exciting, but trying to get pregnant and not happening is not exciting. No, it's not at all. I really empathize with people who are struggling with that. So it's great to have this basic conversation and even people who maybe aren't you know, quite ready to try and conceive, but for them to have this information to know when they move into that phase of their lives that they have that knowledge and that information so they can start and know what to expect. So the first, the first question, oh, sorry, we're going to say something. No, I was just going to say, I I wanted to just ground this a little bit in our, probably a lot of our conversation will be around the cis female and cis male having intercourse, sexual intercourse to try to get pregnant. And, and we can talk about non-binary people, trans people, lesbian, gay, there's so many other people trying to conceive beside that typical heteronormative paradigm, we're, we're, we'll, but we'll probably mostly talk about that today, I think. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah that's fair to um, say. Yeah. But we're happy to chat and focus in on different groups as well, trying to conceive. So we're going to be using probably female and male as pronouns, yeah. really just focusing on, on, on yeah. that, that, that heteronormative paradigm when there's many other paradigms. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes when I'm talking with my patients, they'll say like intercourse or insemination because lots of people do home. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for identifying that. So I guess the first basic question that you can help us explore is 
How do people know if they can get pregnant? You probably don't, though, truthfully, most people can. So you, most people will start with the assumption that they're very fertile mm -hmm. because we've been taught that most people are very fertile. And that's true when you're young, for sure. So on the female side, if you have a period every month, you're probably going to be fertile. Now, we don't know if your uterus is good. We don't know if your tubes are open or anything like that. But if you've got a period every month, that's a good place to start for a female. For a male, if you haven't had an infection of your testicles or surgery on your testicles, you're probably going to be fertile too. Mm -hmm. But if after a certain amount of time you, you're, you've not gotten pregnant, then it's time to, it's time to dig a little deeper. Yeah. And so those time frames, can you review them for us again that we sort I of typically follow? Under, it's really personal, right? Because if your periods are irregular, then you might go a bit sooner. Or if you know, you know, you've had surgery to remove one of your tubes, well, geez, you might go a little sooner too. But a general guideline, if you're under 35 and you've been trying for about nine months to a year, it's time to, to talk to your doctor and say, hey, I haven't gotten pregnant. It's been nine months. It's been a year. Mm -hmm. Certainly at the year mark under, under 35, you should seek some help. Over 35, start thinking about getting help at six months. Mm -hmm. And then people who are over 40, do you say... As soon as you decide to start. Yeah, right? <laughs> right away. Because you just don't want to waste precious months and exactly. then find out later you had some fixable thing like a block tube we could have unblocked. Totally. Like that. totally. And I think that's a really important message because I don't know what you're seeing in Vancouver, but I know here in Victoria, in our population, we're definitely seeing people into their 40s, you know, getting pregnant and trying to most, conceive. Most certainly. Yeah. And I think, I think about a third it is of our, of our patients are only seeing us because they just waited too long. And yeah. they didn't wait too long because they were lazy or disinterested or, but they, they didn't meet someone until they were later, or they were working on a degree or they were traveling the world or they were doing something else. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a lot of people that it's just age and time that's gotten away from them. That being said, again, we can, we can go off into a tangent at some point too, about donor eggs, which, which are an option for people, particularly after 43 or 44. So, you know, we treat people up to the age of 51 in Canada. So there's, there is some time for um, other ways to cr create family, but for the, the typical couple that we're talking about today, you know, after 40, you're right, start get get it investigated right away. Now. So for, if we're talking about, you know, under 35 or under 40 and people are, have decided they want to start a family what sort of would you recommend for people in terms of, you know, when to have intercourse, when to try, you know, sort of the advice around that basic right. timing? Um, so you start trying, you've got your period. What I would do if I was really, you know, keen to make a concerted effort to conceive and I was starting to try, I would start to track my periods. So mm -hmm. there's lots of apps. There's a flow app. There's several apps in the mm -hmm. app store. They're all free. And you just start to track your period. And if you want, you could also monitor to see when you're most fertile. And when we say you're most fertile, that's when you're actually, the egg is ready to be fertilized. It's come out of the ovary. It's in your fallopian tubes and it's ready to be fertilized. And that day is preceded by a surge in a hormone called LH. And that hormone LH, you can detect in your urine. Mm -hmm. So what you might want to do is go to a pharmacy or go to Amazon and buy what are called LH urine test strips. They're also called ovulation predictor strips or LH kits. Mm -hmm. They're detecting that hormone. And that hormone is only high pretty much the day before you ovulate. For example, if you've got a period about every month, great. You're probably ovulating. If you want to figure out exactly what day you are most fertile and that meaning that's the day you should have sex, you'll want to check your urine starting maybe cycle day 10 and day mm -hmm. one is always the day of full flow. So you start day one is full flow count 10 days later, start peeing on a stick every day. And when it's positive, that means the LH is high. And that means the next day you're going to ovulate. And that's the day you want to have sex. Now, some people find strips a bit stressful because it's kind of this, it's, it does add some intensity. To it. So if you don't want to do strips, which is very fair, especially starting out, you may just want to have sex around that time because we know sperm can be stored up in your body. So it would be very reasonable to have sex, say cycle day 10, 12, 14, 16, like every second day around anticipated ovulation, which is usually day 14. Mm -hmm. So if you were to build up a bit of sperm by having sex day 10, 12, and then 14, and maybe 16, just in case that month is a bit late, that would be, that would be the way to start. Don't use lubricants unless you use something called pre-seed. And if you're starting you to try in Canada, sorry to interrupt. Can you right. get pre-seed in Canada? You can, you just buy yeah. it. 
at online or at any pharmacy. Okay. Pretty much. okay. Just another tool. I can't remember the name of it, but there are two fertility friendly lubricants okay. if you need to use them. And then the other thing too, is if you're starting to try, you know, you also want to take a prenatal vitamin. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you haven't been, you know, vaccinated, usually we, we always check people before they come to the clinic to make sure that they're immune to chickenpox and stuff. Cause you don't want to get pregnant after, you know, a year of trying and then catch chickenpox and the baby gets sick or something. Yeah. Like that's so usually, Hey, you're going to start trying not a terrible time to talk to your family doc and say, Hey, I'm just starting to try anything I should do. And they'll say, yeah, prenatal vitamin. Let's do some blood work to see if that you're immune to some yeah. of these bad infections in pregnancy. Yeah. Awesome. I am. Um, I'm love loving hearing what you're saying because I give similar advice to my patients right. in terms of se- having sex every other day from around. I, I'll say like day ten to day twenty, depending on the cycle length. Because yeah. so if somebody has and correct me if I'm wrong, if somebody has say like a thirty five day cycle, then they're ovulating later. They are. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so and that's why if they have a longer cycle, I'll say just you know, day 10 to day 20, because we don't 100% know. What is your thoughts around cervical monitoring cervical mucus or basal body temperature? Yeah, cervical mucus, it's one of those things that's kind of reassuring if you note it, but a lot of women don't note it or don't notice the difference. It is true. Your cervical mucus absolutely changes and gets stringier Mm -hmm. around ovulation. That's a really Mm -hmm. good sign, but so few people, you know, consistently see the change. So, but it's great sign. And if you want to monitor it and you're, and you're into that for sure, I'd say the same, I had the same sort of blase attitude towards basal body temperature starting. It's It's a lot. It's a lot. (laughs) Every day you got to remember before you even move in the morning, you got to check your temperature and chart it and then try to interpret this graph. that's really subtle, the difference in temperature that happens in a menstrual cycle. So some people love it. Like if you're kind of a data person, then maybe you do basal body temperature. But I I generally discourage it because I think, you know, already putting some pressure on people. This adds another level of pressure that most people don't need. Yeah. No, I agree. And I think the basal body temperature is so like, you even need like a very specific thermometer, right? That measures to True. like the point. point two, right? Yeah, yeah. down to point, yeah. the thermometer goes down to point one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then another question we get a lot of is people wondering about timing of intercourse and do they need to let the sperm build up? Is it bad to have sex every day if you want to? Uh, what are your recommendations around that? Yeah, it, it's funny. If a guy has a really high count, probably sex every day is okay. But in general, you should wait a day to let the sperm build back up. Mm-hmm. Because you'll, you'll see couples who are having a sex every day. And then by the time you actually get to ovulation, the counts has dropped. So Jen, we do say every second day is ideal. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. I'm like whew, giving all the right advice. <laughs> yeah, and so in terms of other things, one thing people ask us about is, you know, abstaining from alcohol and all those other lifestyle measures. And I don't know if you give any particular advice around that when people are trying to conceive. Yeah, you know, so for females, we, we always say like a glass of wine is not going to going to harm your fertility yeah. in any meaningful way. So have a glass of wine. Caffeine is actually not going to harm your fertility, though. In early pregnancy, there may be an association with miscarriage. Mm-hmm. So I generally say, look, start try trying to consume 200 milligrams or less of caffeine, mm-hmm. which for most people is about a cup of coffee, maybe two per day yeah. or less. And then I always say, like, for people who are, if because again, I'm seeing people who haven't gotten pregnant. So yeah. I say, cut back a bit on your exercise, you know, these ultra marathons or hot yoga. I don't think that's healthy. You know, raising your core temperature. I don't think it's healthy. We know yeah. it's unhealthy for sperm for sure. Probably yeah. it's not healthy for ovaries either. So I say back off on things that increase high core temperature and just back off and kind of, I don't know. I mean, this is coming more from my friends who are naturopaths, but like, let's get energetically, let's get energy going to reproductive totally. systems. Love it. I love it. Yeah. On the marathon. So You know, and and even if you think back to like what people historically have thought of as the picture of a fertile woman, she's usually actually not very thin. She usually probably would have a BMI between 25 and 30. And that seems to be ideal for, for, you know, so you don't want to be a BMI over 30. You don't want to be obese in any way, but you know, you, you don't need, you know, running marathons, we know when that kind of stress can harm. I also think there's a real value in getting good night's sleep, which sounds really a lot motherhood and apple pie, but we looked, we've looked and, and other groups have looked at melatonin levels in a woman's bloodstream, but also in the fluid around eggs. And it does correlate with egg quality and actually overall IVF success rates. So getting a good night's sleep. If you're a shift worker, that might mean, you know, you have to take some melatonin before your longest sleep, Mm -hmm. but try to get, you know, a good sleep. And if you can't, then take some melatonin. Most studies have looked at three milligrams of melatonin, maybe helpful for your egg quality. So no harm to that if you need to take some melatonin to sleep, but 
do all those motherhood and apple pie things. And I know, and, and you'll know this too, Sarah, that there's people will tell you the stories about their overweight, boozing friend who smokes a pack a day and got pregnant easily. Yep. For sure, we know there's exceptions to these kind of mm-hmm. rules. But by the time you're coming to see, you know, you and I, you probably aren't finding it that easy. And it may just be some small lifestyle change that's going to put you over into that fertile zone. And and again, often that that smoking person who smokes cigarettes and is boozing and things like that, they're often younger than you too. So yeah. they yeah. had less oxidative damage to their to their ovaries um, and to their eggs. You know, they got a different protoplasm than you do. And yours is probably a little more fragile as you get older. We, mm-hmm. uh, we get a little more fragile, a little more damage to our eggs. So you might just be a little different, as frustrating as that is, but yeah. it's true. A little more fragile as we get older. We see that a lot, hey. And so we briefly t- we touched on this before. So if people are doing the LH kits or they're monitoring their cervical mucus and they're having sex, you know, every other day around. So we know sperm can live in the reproductive tract for up to five days, yep. and an egg can an unfertilized egg survives for around twenty four hours. Correct? Right. Yeah. Which is unfair. Very unfair. <laughs> right. So if we're if you're having sex around that fertile window and you're sure, you know, you're pretty certain of your ovulation and you've been trying for that six, nine, twelve months and you're not having success, where do people go from there? Then you need some testing, right? It's funny, the I started out actually as a family doctor and then I became an OBGYN. I didn't it, know that. Really specialist. And I gotta tell you, it gets easier the more specialized. <laughs> more. So we only do we only look at we only really look at four things. We look yeah. at sperm. You need a sperm test. Yeah. You need some sort of test of the uterus, like an ultrasound or something like that. You need some test of the tubes. The best one is an HSG. Mm-hmm. And then you need some test of the ovaries. And I always say there's two tests of the ovaries. One you can do yourself in figuring out if you're ovulating, because there's mm-hmm. only two things we care about with the ovaries. One is, are you ovulating? And number two, do you have some eggs left? Mm-hmm. So that's really all we look at is those four things. Get a sperm mm-hmm. test. Get a test of the uterus and tubes, which can be done in one, just with an HSG, mm-hmm. and then get some sort of assessment of the ovaries. And again, ov- the ovaries are ovulation and and then egg count. Mm-hmm. Now, I know there's a lot of more complicated things that cause infertility, like endometriosis and scarring and things like that. But in general, if you're getting started, those are the four things that you're going to want tested. So you want, you'll go see your, your family doctor and they'll send you for a sperm test. HSG and a blood test to look at your egg count. And the best blood test for egg count, hands down, AMH, mm-hmm. anti lamb heart, which very sadly is not funded by MSP and BC. So it's going to cost at Life Labs around $70. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but it is a very valuable test. It can be done at any day of the menstrual cycle. It really gets a snapshot of what your egg count is like. Is it high? Is it medium? Is it low? And AMH, because I know some people are getting that done and then they're looking at the values themselves because we, we here in BC can look at our lab values. So for those people who have gone out and gotten it done, can you review with us sort of what the values mean? Yeah. Now there's, there's a couple units they'll come back in, but, but Life Labs, who does most of them in the province, it comes back in peak moles. So peak moles, the number will between, between, be between zero and 50. Mm-hmm. But you want to be, certainly you want to be above 10 Um, and you don't want to be above 50 because you probably have polycystic ovarian syndrome if you have above 50, but it gets an easy fix. But anyway, that's the normal range is kind of 10 to 50. Mm -hmm. So when you're 35 and you do an AMA level, if it comes back at 20, you should be happy. If it comes back at 40, you're maybe a little bit happier, but like 20 to 40 would be perfect. And anyone, really anyone who has an AMH above 10 should be kind of fairly reassured at that, at that number. Okay. And then less than 10, then we start to think we're going to have to go on again. Less than 10, yeah. Yeah. And then in terms of, I'm kind of going backwards here, but in terms of, you know, confirming that you are ovulating, what are your thoughts on the value of doing a day 21 progesterone? Yeah, I think it's really valuable. It'll tell you if you ovulate that cycle. Mm -hmm. I don't tend to send them off because a lot of my patients have already checked their urine and they've got a positive surge. So I'm like, okay, well, you're ovulating. And just knowing they have a cycle every month. Mm -hmm. But if you're uncertain, they they come to you and they say, I've never had a positive test in my urine or my urine is unclear then check a day 21 progesterone yeah yeah okay yeah and we'll we'll do that sometimes especially for people who aren't doing the the surge test kit yeah so, but i think those are actually really cheap right you can get them on amazon for quite really quite cheap like 100 for say 25 dollars something like that yeah, yeah they can be at shoppers and, and uh, like london drugs they're pretty expensive they're almost a dollar a strip which adds up that is expensive yeah it gets expensive but yeah there are definitely cheap ways to buy those strips it's like pregnancy tests they're expensive <laughs> I know. I know. It's a costly endeavor trying to get Very pregnant. Costly. Hey, Sarah. Do you know what I've never asked you? 
Did you take a prenatal course when you were pregnant? We did. Even though I'm a maternity care provider, my husband and I thought it would be an important process for us to go through together. That's so cute. <laughs> it must have been so hard for you guys to coordinate your busy schedules, though. Oh, tell me about it. I was a medical resident at the time, and he was working full-time. We really struggled to find a course that would fit our needs and ended up doing a semi-private course that still was challenging to schedule and quite expensive. Wouldn't it have been nice for you guys to have access to an online course with evidence-based content that you could do from the comfort of your own home or on your own time at your own pace? You're telling me. If I had had access to something like our Pregnancy to Parenthood prenatal masterclass, it would have been a game changer. And that's the big reason we put this course together, to provide parents with access to a reliable, comprehensive prenatal education from the comfort of their own homes and the ability to watch it and re-watch it when and where they choose. Plus, it's got so much great information about preparing for the fourth trimester, which I'll admit, I felt really unprepared for. We focus so much on labor and birth when we're pregnant without understanding how challenging breastfeeding in the fourth trimester can be. I hear ya. And that's why we put together such a comprehensive module all about what to expect for the fourth trimester and for your newborn. If any of you listeners are pregnant and thinking about a prenatal course, I may be biased, but I would 100% recommend our online course. Head on over to www dot shefoundhealth.ca backslash masterclass to check it out. We promise you won't be disappointed or your money back. So they have tried and they've either gotten pregnant or not. And then if they're not getting pregnant, we look at things like sperm and then we look at the uterus, the tubes and the ovaries. And then we're not, we're going to do a few more podcasts down the road so everyone can get excited and look forward to those. But in general terms, you know, can you speak a little bit about what does help look like for people that are trying to conceive? Yeah. So, um, you know, infertility clinics, like even like the one I work at, you know, we have these flashy websites and we're all, our photos are on it. We're wearing like n- our nicest, oh, very fancy. white yeah. coat. We look really fancy, which gives the impression that like this, this is really expensive, exclusive thing, but it's really not. We're all working for SP. We're all working just like your family doctor is. And so all your testing, seeing a fertility doctor is all covered. Mm-hmm. The only time it gets expensive is when you start to get into fancy treatments like in vitro fertilization or IVF or mm-hmm. donor eggs, that mm-hmm. kind of stuff gets expensive. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the basic stuff, like checking the sperm, making a couple of tweaks in the sperm. If you have a varicose seal or some little fixable thing mm-hmm. with the sperm, that's all covered. Okay. Taking some pills to make you ovulate. That's all covered. Ultrasounds. They're all covered. Like it's, it's not as, it's not as, in, it shouldn't be intimidating to people. I think sometimes we put this really intimidating thing out there, which is a shame because it should be accessible to everyone. Yeah. And because the vast majority of what we do actually is covered by a provincial plan all across Canada in Ontario. They actually even cover IVF for 5,000 uh, couples a year and, and individuals a year. Wow. Um, and some provinces have tax breaks. So don't start stressing out and saying, I don't want to do fertility treatments because they're so expensive. Get the testing. It's all covered by MSP. Mm-hmm. Should no be no barrier to accessing information and, and the basics of treatment for sure. That's great. That's really helpful to know. And and I think you're right. You know, we briefly talked before we started recording about how stressful trying to conceive can be. And when you're not yeah. having success, the the stress of the unknown about you know, what that next step is going to look like and when to seek care. And and it, it's really nice to lay it out for people because you're right. I think people don't know that there's, you know, sometimes there's just, you take a pill to help you ovulate or yeah. maybe you need to try, I don't know, you guys wash sperm or something like that and inseminate, right? Like there's some, there's some more simple things. Infertility treatment is not just simply IVF. And that's right. Exactly. The other thing I would say, so, so you've been struggling now, you've been trying for nine months and you go, go see your family doctor, get, get, started and you get a referral to a fertility clinic and you're told the wait is three months yeah. and you're feeling disheartened because three months feels like a long wait. But what, yeah. what we do in all of it, I think all the clinics are doing the same thing. What we do is we try to take advantage of those three months. So we send you with some information, like it's kind of this podcast, maybe we should link this podcast. Yeah. Podcast. <laughs> yeah. They give us some information to, to sort of make sure they're doing things kind of right in those three months while you're waiting to see the physician. We also use that time to get all your testing done. So that's when you might get, if you, if you haven't already done it, you might get your HSG done to check the uterus and tubes you might get a repeat sperm test because the first one was a bit funny we might get a repeat mm-hmm. and we'll make sure your egg count's been done we'll often bring you in even based on those preliminary tests he's like look we already see in your preliminary test your thyroid's out of whack we'll give yeah. you a call and say hey i know we're not seeing each other formally for three months but your thyroid's out of whack let's fix that 
So there are, it's not, it's frustrating to wait three months or even sometimes four months nowadays to be seen, but truly we try to make it so that you're not wasting your time in that time. And we've got a great like admin team that kind of helps people to, so you don't feel like you're losing that time. Yeah. Yeah. Because time is, time is eggs. I guess you could say. Time is eggs. I, I agree. And, and I, at the same time, I speak out of both sides of my mouth because I don't want to put too much pressure on people. I know. Um, so it's a tough one. Right. And so that's why it is nice to get that AMH early on. So, you know, if you've got time or not, right. If you've got a high AMH, meaning lots of eggs mm -hmm. and you're 31, you yeah. know what? Three months is going to be okay. Four months yeah. is going to be okay. You know, yeah. and, and that's one of the things too, is, is using that time wisely. And the other thing I would mention in terms of, we talked about optimizing the timing of your course. The other thing I would add is supplements. And I'm, I, I don't want to sound too much like a quack, but I have gotten really keen on supplements because I think a lot of what we've done is we've kind of optimized things, but are we really looking at the kind of quality of eggs and sperm that are coming mm -hmm. through the door? Because mm -hmm. in fertility, we're always trying to get one more percent higher pregnancy rates or two more percent higher pregnancy rates. And I think if you look at what people are bringing through the door, can you do something to improve egg and sperm health? Mm -hmm. And it got me excited because actually a long time ago now, almost 10 years ago now, out of what was published in 2014, but a study out of the University of Toronto that took women going to do IVF, everyone under 40 doing IVF. They took half of them, about 300 women, and they had them take coenzyme Q10. Yeah. And the other half, they didn't take it. Yeah. And they looked at their eggs and they looked at the rates of chromosomal abnormalities like Down syndrome in yeah. those eggs. Yeah. And they were lower, significantly lower in the people who did not, who took the coenzyme Q10. In other words, there was a benefit to CoQ10. Mm -hmm. So now tell me this. Now they took it for eight weeks, a simple little supplement you can buy over the counter and you dramatically improved egg quality. Well, geez, we've got to start to really put some energy into that. And from that, lots of other studies have shown it's just proof that, you know, everything we understand about cell cycle, egg development, sperm development, we really need to go back and say, you know, we're not going to look at the egg on day 14. We want to look at what that egg was doing the last two months. Mm -hmm. And that's where you talk about like lifestyle and stuff too. Yeah. 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 And the best eggs and sperm to us. Yeah. Perfect. So that's like, that's the timing, like where we talk about if you're smoking, you know, smoking cessation and, yep. and cutting out things like, you know, cannabis, even though it's, mm -hmm. it's legal and it's natural, it, it's not necessarily healthy I'm for the really reproductive good, system. For sperm. It's not good for your sperm. Yeah. yeah. And it can it's also, and again, like, the other thing we'll see too is, um, it comes to mind just because just very recently I had to make a phone call for a couple where the guy came to us, they were trying for a while to get pregnant. He comes with great sperm. Then they come in to do IVF. And by the time you get to that point, you've spent like $10,000 or more, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to do IVF. He produces the sample that we are going to fertilize her eggs with. And there's mm -hmm. not a single sperm in the sample. What? You call him. I was like, okay, what's changed since I met you three months ago when we first met? And he had started taking testosterone. Oh, yes. Wipes out sperm. That's the classic story. And you're like, oh, you know, and I, I felt a bit bad that maybe I didn't convey that. I didn't anticipate him starting testosterone. But, you know, just think about what you're putting in your body before yeah. you're trying to get pregnant. And, and you've got some leeway. You've got time because it, it takes, you know, to grow an egg or sperm. It's a couple of months. It's eight mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, it's so true. Right. And, and I love that you're talking about coenzyme Q10 because I will recommend that to patients as well. And I think especially being in BC, people really love doing anything that's considered, you know, natural and how they can sort of avoid taking any unnecessary medical, you know, medications or treatments. And if we can, if we can Im improve egg quality with a simple supplement, let's do it. Yeah. yeah. Now there are supplements with less robust, robust data. And if you're interested in looking at ways to improve your egg health, there is a book written. I'll admit, I haven't even read the book. <laughs> I shouldn't admit that. Um, I don't know the author. Don't know anything about this. But I know that the book, a lot of my patients have read it. Like it's one of those really common books that are read mm -hmm. by patients. It's called It Starts With an Egg. On their website, which is it starts with an egg.com, they have a supplement list, which I really like. So I'll often oh, send cool. my patients to that supplement okay. list. It, they are all reasonable supplements that have some data to support their use. And so I say, go to the supplement page of, of uh, it starts with an egg and have a look. And I know it probably prompts a lot of people to, to read that uh, book, which they should give me some royalties because I prefer that to a lot. Of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, oh, yeah. that's good to know. Yeah. And I feel like I'm glad there's some data behind them because mm -hmm. I mean, as physicians and scientists, I think making sure that what we do has some evidence behind it is really helpful. And especially when it comes right, that's to right. Because like, you know, so we have people come in and they're taking mistletoe or some silly thing. There's no evidence behind it. Mm 
-hmm. And there is a cost to that. I'm going to editorialize mm -hmm. for a second. There's a cost mm -hmm. to that. There's a cost that they spent money on that. Mm -hmm. that there may be a, a contraindication or some sort of interaction with another medication they're taking. And they've probably wasted time thinking it's going to help them, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to say, I'm going to give the mistletoe. I'm using this as an example. I'm going to get, use the mistletoe. I'm going to let that, yeah. I'm going to take that orally for three months and I'm going to wait. Now I'm 43. Like you've lost, you know, so yeah. there's a cost to sort of non-evidence-based advice. And so, yeah, this, but this, it starts with an egg is actually a pretty good resource, I think. I would agree. Yeah. And I think there's a cost to seeking care from, from someone who's, this is not their area of expertise. I've had patients who were given, you know, topical progesterone to try and help with yeah. pregnancy. And when we, mm -hmm. when we actually did the day 21 progesterone, she's not ovulating. Like, Right. Yeah. And so that topical progesterone prescription cream that she's been applying for months that we yeah. also know progesterone isn't that well absorbed and she's not even ovulating. Yeah. And so there's that time cost and that all those out of pocket costs. So I think, you know, just making sure there's evidence and understanding. Yeah, that's it. a heartbreak when you see that happen. Right. And yeah, yeah. they wasted time and money and uh, yeah. Yeah. Another, another question we sometimes get, and I don't know how much you can comment on this is people who are they are getting pregnant, but then they're having those recurrent early losses yeah. and they want to know, they talk, there's all these people researching and about um, the short luteal phase. Right. Yeah. Right. And I know that the evidence has sort of gone back and forth. Can you comment on that at all? Because people are always saying, well, should I be taking progesterone? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, you know, the, it is a thing. It yeah. is absolutely a thing. Yeah. The short phase, we know progesterone deficiency can cause repeated really early miscarriages. Absolutely. It's not a common thing. Okay. So a hundred women think they have it. It mm -hmm. is a real thing, but only about five of them actually have it. Yeah. And that's the issue is that I think we really want, a lot of people want to have it because it's such an easy fix for that. But if you have repeated miscarriages, you should get that panel of testing done that looks at all the immunologic and uh -huh. thrombophilic and the blood clotting disorders and things and uterine anomalies that can cause it. You should get that all looked at. And as part of that, have a look at that luteal phase and how, mm -hmm. whether you are low in progesterone. So it is a thing. Progesterone supplementation helps. It's just not that common, despite what I think people want to believe or are told. It's not very common, but it, it is, you know, when you see it and, and, and it's such a gratifying thing to treat, but it's such a rare thing to treat because yeah. it's usually not cause, right? Yeah. And I think that's really helpful too for people, because like you said, like you just want that to be the cause. So then you can yeah, treat it and go on to get pregnant, but you know, it's important because there's lots of other things, like you said, like certain, you know, hematologic conditions that can cause yes. recurrent losses. Yeah. Okay. Anything that you else you think we should sort of talking about the basics of getting pregnant that we haven't covered today that we should? No, I think that's, that's it. I mean, we, we focus a lot on the female because they're often the ones doing the Googling or doing the worrying or contacting mm -hmm. the doctor and trying to move, move things forward. They're often the ones that lead that, but you know, sperm is, is 50% of this story. So yeah. guys should also optimize their sperm health. So guys should, you know, avoid heat. It's just, it's just a terrible toxin for sperm. So hot tubs, saunas, you know, long bike rides. Mm -hmm. I always say we see iron men. I mean, when iron man was a big thing a few years ago before the smoke fires and all the mm -hmm. splitting up of iron man, when iron man was big, we'd always see the iron man guys come in the fall. They had no sperm in the fall and they have sperm in the, again, the spring. Yeah. <laughs> You've been riding your bike for eight hours, you know, yeah. you're going to lose your sperm, but they'll come back. So long bike rides, hot tubs, saunas, anything with heat, really avoid it. Laptops, you know, it all matters. And so guys should avoid heat and they actually should avoid caffeine, you know, more than a couple hundred milligrams as well. And alcohol and marijuana, mm -hmm. they should leave, live clean as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do it together. That's a good thing. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. Weight loss too for, you know, we know weight impact yeah. all parts of fertility. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, it's just, it can be such a sensitive topic, you know, talking mm -hmm. about infertility and trying to get pregnant. So I think this is a really great resource for people to have if they're, if they're, you know, starting to think about planning a pregnancy, but they're not really wanting to talk to a lot of people about it because it's still a very infertility and trying to get pregnant it can still be really uncomfortable for some people to talk about. And I'm sure you, you see that a lot. Yeah. And then I think people downplay the significance of it. Sometimes when I'm doing, I'm putting an embryo in a woman or we're doing an insemination. Sometimes I'll, I'll just pause. I can see they're tearing and I'll say, what we're doing is really important here, isn't it to you? You know, like, and, and it's really important and it's, and it is, it's really significant in, in, in people's lives. And, um, and it's hard to talk about things that are that important, that private. Yeah. So, but you know, you'd be surprised. It's funny. Once you crack that seal and start talking about it, 
you'll find so many people themselves or, or, or someone nearby has been really touched with, with a yeah. challenging pregnancy story or fertility story. Yeah. yeah. And on our, our Instagram page, we've had lots of people reach out to us and ask that we do more around trying to get pregnant and understanding IVF because I think people, and I don't, you might not see this so much, right? Because people are desperately trying to get pregnant and then perhaps they get pregnant through infertility. And it's such a, I've heard such good things about like the support people get through your clinic and other clinics and then they're pregnant and they're like, now what, right? They're so used to having that connection. So if we can normalize this conversation in the wider context of pregnancy and postpartum, then people will be We'll have a community to continue on with. A community, you're right. They do get get dropped off at the end of the first trimester by by people yeah. like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You gotta go on to help the others, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But we're here to support them through yeah. and postpartum. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. I'm really I excited. really enjoyed this. I'm happy oh, to do this anytime. Okay. I'd love to do this again. Yeah, yeah. We've got a few more. We've had requests for IVF, so more specifics around yeah. in vitro fertility, and also egg freezing, which. I was thinking about back when I was an OBS gynae resident and wasn't sure where my future was going. Maybe I should have gotten my eggs frozen, but it worked out okay for me. <laughs> since, you, since you've come through the, the program, it's a common thing now for OBGYN residents to get their AMH checked. Totally. I bet. Yeah. I would have been doing that if this was a, if I was in there now. That's so funny. Well, thanks. You know, you know how you, everyone knows the credit score. You probably yeah. should be like that. If you know your credit score, you should know your AMH, AMH if you're a female. Oh, that's so funny. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Beth. It's been a total pleasure. Lovely to connect with you. Take care. You too. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca and to sign up for our community for weekly bump blasts. Make sure to check us out on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood and head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review and a five-star rating. If you enjoyed this podcast, take a pic of yourself listening to it and share it on social. Make sure to tag us on it so we know to keep making them.